Alright, we've got two seconds to get out all our childish excitement, and then it's time for a serious video. Oh my god, the A10 ads! <clears throat> So for all of you who happen to either only watch my channel for some reason Seriously, what's wrong with you? Go watch Tankenstein Or you just live under a rock The A10 Warthog will be arriving in War Thunder in the upcoming update Winds of Change Proving once and for all that I am bloody good at predicting what comes to this game No, we said serious <clears throat> Professional Let's try that again the A-10 is one of, if not the most controversial military aircraft that exists, and there is so much to talk about with its coming to War Thunder. This is a day some of us have known was coming for a little while, uh, many have suspected or assumed it would come eventually, while just as many seem to have been adamant that it would never happen at all, right up until a couple of weeks ago. But it is here now, and even though this definitely isn't news to any of you anymore, I want to have a discussion about not just what you can expect from the A-10 and some of my thoughts on it, a little bit of a buyer's guide or more buyer beware guide, but also how it's going to affect the game when it comes. I remember saying something very similar to this when the F-4 Phantom and MiG-21 were first announced, but with an aircraft this sort of prominent and famous, or infamous depending on which side you're on, if I wanted to delve into its design and its history like I usually do with dev blogs, we would be here until the update comes out. Plus if I wanted to do that then I'd have to go into all the controversy of its design, its capabilities and I just don't really want to do that right now, This it's not super relevant to today's discussion. When the F4 and MiG-21 came out, what I did is just touch on their history here and then cover them each in a Koala Explains episode where I could devote a wee bit more time to them. But we don't have Koala Explains anymore, we have the Armorcast channel instead. We have been away from the Armorcast channel for quite a while now, especially with the terrible events going on in Ukraine, I kind of wanted to distance myself from that sort of topic. But we should be returning to regular content there this week, and then we'll talk all about the Warthog in one of our upcoming vehicle bios there. So go sub to Armorcast, and for now I'm going to, again, touch very quickly on the A-10 itself, and mainly we'll talk about its implications for War Thunder. The A-10 traces its history back to the early stages of the Cold War, where the US Air Force's heavy focus on high-speed fighter interceptors and long-range heavy bombers left them with little resources to allocate toward new and modern close-in attack platforms. Going into the Vietnam War, the primary ground attack aircraft of the US Air Force was the propeller-driven A-1 Sky Raider, a phenomenal aircraft in its own right, but one rapidly becoming outdated. Though the Air Force did take delivery of LTV's A7 Corsair II, the need for a dedicated USAF close air support platform that could operate under harsh conditions was obvious. The request for a new CAS aircraft was put forth in September of 1966, along with a separate program for what would become the aircraft's primary armament, a 30mm rotary cannon. The primary requirements of the program were to create an extremely durable, low-cost and reliable strike aircraft, one that could operate safely from poorly prepared airstrips without significant supporting infrastructure, and one that could engage infantry positions and armoured vehicle columns alike. The two final proposals were Northrop's YA-9, resembling in many ways the Soviet Su-25, and Fairchild Republic's YA-10, while General Electric was selected to build the Gau-8 Avenger 30mm cannon. Interestingly, as the gun was not ready during the testing of the two prototypes, which began on the 10th of May 1972, an M61 Vulcan gun was used as a placeholder. Despite being the faster of the two aircraft by about 100km per hour, the YA-9 was passed over in favour of the Fairchild Republic YA-10 which entered service in 1977, receiving the designation A-10A Thunderbolt II, an homage to Republic's legendary P-47 Thunderbolt. The aircraft housed no less than 11 hardpoints for suspended armament, including a wide range of dumb bombs, rocket pods and air-to-ground missiles like the AGM-65 Maverick, along with ECM pods and external fuel tanks. Up to four Sidewinder missiles can be carried for self-defence, though the aircraft seldom carries more than two, in twin rails on either the first or the eleventh hardpoint. Paveway laser-guided bombs could also be used with the integration of the Pave Penny laser spot tracker, but required another asset to do the actual lasing, as the Penny pod is receiver only, much like the first generation of Harrier jump jets. That means don't expect to see Paveways on the A-10 in War Thunder. 
The aircraft tops out at a speed just shy of 720 km per hour, dropping to around 550 with heavy loads, and pilots quickly named it the Warthog, or just Hog if you don't have much time. The flight control systems and linkages were not only relatively well armoured, but also triple redundant, allowing the aircraft to fly back to base with excessive amounts of damage to wings, engines, and the airframe itself. The pilot was further encased in a well armoured cockpit, referred to as the bathtub, protected from below against machine gun fire right up to 23mm autocannons. But since this isn't so much a plane with a gun, but a gun with some wings, engines and a tail, and a pilot to point it in the right direction, let's talk about the Avenger cannon. Initially designed as the perfect combination of the anti-infantry suppressive fire that had proven its worth on the gunships of the Vietnam War, and a tank-busting hailstorm of lead, the GAU-8 makes up such a significant portion of the A-10's weight that if it's removed for maintenance, the rear of the aircraft has to be supported to prevent it from tipping backwards. At a hair under two tons, the entire gun assembly, including the ammunition drum, weighs about the same as an entire T6 Texan. The gun fires either high explosive or depleted uranium armour piercing rounds, the latter capable of punching through main battle tanks armour, though in truth predominantly designed to engage lighter vehicles like IFVs or APCs. Rate of fire is almost 4000 rounds per minute, with a total ammunition capacity just shy of 1200 rounds. The Warthog's combat debut wouldn't be until the 1991 Persian Gulf War, where it achieved success, though at the cost of some controversy, with multiple blue-on-blue -blue incidents due to a lack of IFF equipment that resulted in the loss of several Allied vehicles and many lives. Rectifying this problem, along with several others, including the inability to self-guide laser-based munitions, resulted in the more modern A-10C, which has stepped perfectly into the role of counterinsurgency close air support, supporting troops in Iraq and Afghanistan, and continuing to prove its worth despite endless attempts by multiple parties to get the aging BERT platform retired. As I've said before, I don't think I know anyone with just an average opinion on the A-10. It's either the greatest invention since sliced bread, or it's a complete waste of metal not even worth the oxygen of the pilots who fly it. There seem to be very few people, and I count myself as one of them, who see the A-10 as a great platform, but a far from perfect one. Its low speed and lack of advanced technologies being definite trade-offs, but worthwhile ones for the extreme survivability, cost effectiveness, quick reaction time, and convenience. This thing was built to scramble at a moment's notice much quicker than contemporary aircraft like F-16s or F-111s, and not only do the job cheaper, but also to be operable from dirt strips without any sort of ground support. That's something you can't say about any of the comparators that most people will tell you are superior for the role. Then there's of course the psychological effect of that BERT. Although other guns do make that sound, the Hunters 30 mils do it for example, the AC-130 sounds, well, spooky, and let's be honest, Vulcan BERT sounds better than Avenger BERT any day of the week. Fuck, why do I say that? There goes every like on this video. <laughs> Couple that with its ability to take an absolute beating that would down pretty much any other aircraft by having redundant flight control systems. Remember, you don't have to destroy an elevator. If you sever its link to the flight stick, that aircraft isn't controllable anymore. And the A-10 is a very effective platform. Just a highly specialised one. It's no multi-role platform, it's dedicated to one specific use case, and the role it's meant for isn't the role it'll end up having to play in War Thunder, that of a dedicated tank buster combating T-90s and Leopard 2s and supported by modern anti-aircraft systems like Tunguskas and Rolands. This is why a lot of people have straight up said that this aircraft wouldn't work in the game, and now that it is coming, well, let's talk about it. What I've kind of suspected for a while might happen is that we'd get an A-10A as a premium aircraft and then an A-10C with paveways, JDAMs and AIM-9Ms for self-defense as a tech trade jet. And let's be honest, despite being a controversial move to sell A-10s to potentially new players at very high VRs, this was very obviously going to happen. Gaijin would be mad not to offer this legendary and iconic platform for sale. It's about the most marketable thing we've had in games since the M1 Abrams. 
well, maybe helicopters. Instead, what we're receiving is two different iterations of the A10A, the premium being labelled early, while the tech tree model will be a late configuration. Now, I'm going to talk later on in the video about whether or not I think this is worth it to buy, but if you're already sold on it, remember to use my link to support the channel. It's down below. You can get our decal and game, and any purchases you end up making through our link, you get 3% off. I gotta admit, I kind of don't like this idea that Gaijin can just label something early and late whenever they want and effectively sell the same thing twice, as they did with the German F4F or the A4E or even the Q5. These aren't two different variants of the A10, it's the same variant twice with one being arbitrarily limited, with the premium example not equipping the AGM65D Mavericks with a thermal optic and only mounting two rather than the optional four A9L Sidewinders. Now instead, what could be done, I've suggested to Gaijin, is just making them both identical models as far as weaponry, or limiting the premium based on a specific time frame, but naming the premium model for a specific pilot, such as we have with Richard Bong's P-38J, uh, George Botswick's P-47M, or René Charles' Yak-9T. A good option perhaps would be Captain Dale Storr, whose A-10A was shot down over Kuwait during the Gulf War, and it wasn't known that he survived the crash until he was released by Iraqi forces at the end of the war. Uh, Storr's squadron, including one John Marks, took part in a famous attack that resulted in the destruction of 23 Iraqi tanks in a single afternoon. So either Marks A-10A or Storr's A-10A, has a much better ring to it, I feel, than A10A early in brackets, and forcing the tech tree model to have this late handle while also limiting the premium for no good reason, just to sell that difference. So if you like this idea of naming the A10 premium for a specific pilot who flew it rather than just early, uh, please let me know and tell Gaijin what you think. They have told me they're open to the idea. Uh, just that there are a couple more hoops to jump through if they were to use the name of still living pilots rather than World War II aces like Richard Bong. Now that brings us on to the weapons, and more importantly, a new loadout mechanic that Gaijin have hinted at to be coming with this patch. Now this is something I've been asking Gaijin for as much as I can for, well, ever since sparrows were added actually. So if it comes to the game in the way that I've been hoping for, then I will be so happy to see the introduction of this update. Uh, what I expect this to be is the ability to select a hardpoint and then choose what type of ordnance goes on it out of what's available, probably being duplicated automatically on the opposite side, at least in most cases. Uh, what I hear is that this mechanic will come for all the new jets and existing aircraft will begin to receive it a few at a time, uh, kind of like volumetric armor, 3D tracks, cockpit updates, etc. What I do wonder though is how Gaijin might handle asymmetric ordnance. As I said, A10s typically carry two sidewinders on one side and an ECM pod or a paveway on the other, but since we don't have ECM pods in War Thunder, not jammers at least, and you can only really carry 500 pound bombs on the outermost hardpoints otherwise, there's no downside to just carrying both sidewinder rails. Other than that, both the A-10s will have access to GBU-8s, up to four of them. These are the optically tracked guided bombs that can lock and hit moving targets like tanks. Uh, Mark 80 series bombs, obviously, and actually SUU-23 Vulcan gun parts, the ones from the F-4C. Not that I can see why you'd ever want to load them, besides, I guess, head-on memes. Now, as I said, the Premium will have the ability to carry six AGM-65Bs, while the tech tree model will have six AGM-65Ds. These are often said to be infrared homing. It's not quite as simple as that. They don't track heat sources like a Sidewinder does, but looking for targets to lock will be a lot easier because you have a thermal sight to be able to pick them out against the gray background. Now, these missiles have a theoretical range of 23 kilometers, but that's from altitude and at a launch speed of, I believe, Mark 1.4. So from the A-10, which doesn't climb particularly well and obviously is barely gonna surpass 600 kph with ordnance, that range will drop to around eight to 10 kilometers. However, on the dev server, the A-10s both sat at a battle rating of 9.7, and while dev server BRs are obviously subject to change, wow, first time I've said that this year, should they stay there, the A-10s will be pretty overpowered in a down tier. In a full down tier, which is relatively common thanks to T-72AV spam, 
you won't fight any optically guided surface to air missiles, mostly gun AA which tend to top out at 4km range, and infrared guided SAMs which the A-10 is functionally immune to, with a whopping 480 flares. Given that one of the main drawbacks and in fact balancing factors of the A-10 is supposed to be its lack of speed and its ability to easily be caught by AA, the ability to sit completely out of range of the AA anyway and rack up 6 ground kills whenever you feel like it, and then be engaging the aircraft like Venoms to maybe MiG-21 PFMs that come to intercept you with AIM-9Ls will be extremely overpowered, especially the Tech Tree model. Now in up tier, you do have Rolands to deal with, Tunguskas if you get unlucky and get a full up tier, or you're playing it in your top tier lineup, which is what I think a lot of players will do, including me, and it should be pretty balanced there. It'll be a challenge to use effectively, but certainly still capable of it. Personally, I would suggest a battle rating of 10.3, at least initially, maybe 10.0 for the premium, but that way it can never just sit out of range and get kills. I don't tend to agree when people say that CAS is cancer in tank battles and that we need a tanks only game mode because aircraft are so OP, especially at top tier, but at the same time aircraft should never be able to reliably score kills from outside counterable range. It should never be that easy to have that much of an effect on the game. And that leads us neatly into the main way you should actually use the A-10 if you want to be effective. And this might upset some of you, you're not going to be hearing that burt very often. The gun on the A-10, while it was designed for engaging Soviet armoured vehicle columns of the time, is mainly effective against light vehicles like BMPs, BTRs, MTLBs, and not so much main battle tanks, that's what your GBUs and Mavericks are for. To get within gun range, you also have to get close, which puts you in easy range of AA systems, which you want to try to avoid. Now in real life, these things are built to engage forces without any modern AA, or forward assets that are operating outside the protective bubble of AA, so in those circumstances, it'll be safe to go in for gun runs. But in War Thunder, you know, an SPAA or SAM could spawn in at any point, so Try and stay out of range. Instead, you're going to want to hang out at range, get some altitude, and circle around the edges of the map looking for targets. You want to be getting in range of AA only just long enough to get your ordnance off and then be dipping as far back out of it as possible to make sure you don't get hit. So with that in mind, the loadout I'm going to recommend for ground forces is 2 GBU-8s and 6 Mavericks, plus Sidewinders, either 2 or 4, along with you can then add 3 Mark 84 2000 pound bombs under the fuselage. Uh, mainly, these are to be used if an enemy jet is following you, you drop them at low level with a delay of about 1.5 seconds, and get yourself a very easy kill. If you can, I would recommend using the GBU-8s on SPAA, since they tend to stay pretty much stationary in their own spawn, and that way you save your Mavericks for use against targets like tanks. You'll definitely have a better time on more open maps like Folder, Karsk, Maginot Line or Red Desert, uh, maybe Spaceport where you can then use the tall buildings to block line of sight from AA, and on urban maps like Advance to the Rhine, Breslau, maps with a lot of cover, uh, you might just be better off not spawning the thing at all. Not every vehicle in every lineup suits every map. This is also where I'm going to say, please don't be that guy who takes the A-10 into Air RB by yourself, especially don't troll squad with 3 or 4 A-10s. If you especially want to meme and you can't restrain yourself to custom battles or arcade mode, which is more for that sort of thing, then grab a squad of players in actual fighters to fly with. Trust me, you'll have a much better time, so will the rest of your team. On the big EC maps, where ground attack is a thing, the A-10 is way too slow to cover the ground in the time available. If you want to ground pound, just go play in F-105 or A-7. And on the regular sized maps, you are pretty much useless. And remember, there are no air spawns in jets anymore, so you'll be taken off alongside F-105s and Harriers, so you probably won't even get to any of the bases, and you are basically the McDonald's meal of the sky for any half-decent fighter that wants you dead. Now that does mean that Gaijin, you'd better give the Tech Tree A-10 some respectable ground attack ordnance stuck. If this thing has Hydra rockets only to start out with, and you're expected to grind even for 500 pound bombs, that would be really dumb. 
the last point I want to cover is sort of what I expect the addition of this aircraft to do to the game. What will gameplay be like at this thing's BR when it's introduced? Now, first off, I don't have much of a problem with the quote unquote top tier premiums being ground attackers for ground battles because their spawn point cost means that if players want to jump into the thing, especially with Mavericks or GBUs, they still have to at least know what they're doing enough to get the spawn points in the first place. It's not as cringe as level 6 players in their MiG-21s or F5Cs having no clue what they're doing, they don't know the mechanics, how the game works, and they let the team down. Having said that, the spawn point cost for top tier aircraft with guns only is very very low. It's basically a single capture point and maybe a scout if you're in a light tank and that's it. Now that's been okay for now because helicopter spawn point cost is also extremely low so you need aircraft to go and counter them and it has been that way since shortly after helis were added and Gaijin wanted premium helicopters to be more marketable. But I mean, those sorts of inexperienced players who want to jump on the hype train of the A-10 and the sort of inexperienced players who tend to let teams down when they spawn in their high tier premiums and don't know really what they're doing, well, what's the A-10's signature weapon? It's not the Mavericks, it's not the GBUs, it's Burt. So, unfortunately, I'm predicting a lot of M22s and M2A2s, maybe M18s if you're lucky that can actually kill something at top tier, played by low-level, inexperienced players, rushing caps, taking all the spawn points, dying, hopping into their A-10s and just trying to go for gun runs on enemy tanks they probably won't help your team out at all. And it may work a little when you're getting spammed by these things from all directions, even the best SPAA player can't really do much. But it's not going to be an effective way to play the game, because for all the freeaboos wanting to play the A-10, there are just as many wearaboos and russophiles desperate to shoot the things down. So. I expect very much that the American win rates are going to drop about as low with this patch, if not lower, than they ever have. Than they did when the XM1 was a top tier premium, and in fact it was the only one, and uh, it pretty much broke War Thunder in a way that we've never really recovered from. So if you are desperate to play your shiny new premium Thunderbolt, please by all means do so. But play it in customs, or arcade, or even sim, where... No, wait, the team going. Oh god, what have I done? Oh, what have I done? Look, you won't have much of a great time trying to play this thing in RB mode when it first comes out, unless you're playing it properly, using the Mavericks and the GBUs, and also not just rushing to spawn it straight in as soon as you can. The temptation is there, I know, but just like with regular close air support, if you spawn it in at the wrong time, you'll just get shot down without doing much for your team, let your team down, and lose a heck of a lot of games, and a heck of a lot of Silver Lions. And the same is true in RRB. If you're trying to spawn in, you see a whole spam of A-10s in your match, just don't even take off. You've already lost, just go spade your Russians instead. It's the perfect time for that. Speaking of which, now that we've done a little to maybe help all the budding A-10 players have a better time, and I'm excited for you, I really am, but uh, you should click off this video now, because now, are they gone? Are they gone? Yep, yeah, good. Now let's ruin it. So if you really want to have fun with this aircraft in the game, the key is not to play it, but to play against it. Like I said, a lot of American players will be rushing caps just to get in and burr it as much as they can. So as a Russian or German top tier player, anyone facing the Americans, Perhaps let them take the caps. Let them gather a few spawn points. Pick a nice location to ambush players driving out of the caps after they've taken them and uh, kill them then. Then, if you get taken out, hop in an AA. A Roland is a perfect example. The Shulka, not so much, but you will see a lot of A10s at top BR, so feel free to try this with the Tunguska. Uh, the Yenisei actually might be the perfect culprit for this if you're playing maybe the 9.0 lineup and you want to up tier it with it. And of course, the Swedes have the AA version of the CV-90, which might be the best of the bunch for this kind of thing. Trust me, you will pick up the easiest double ace you've ever seen in your life. So, with all that being said, is the A-10A Premium worth buying? And to answer that, I'm afraid I have to say no. But there's... 
Well, there's a but. If you're already so in love with the idea of playing this aircraft as soon as possible, you're already sold on it, then for sure go pick it up, don't let me stop you, link below. Uh, but this part of the video isn't really for you. But if you're not already 100% all in for buying the A-10, you're on the fence about it, you're not sure if it's $60 worth of fun just to fly an A-10 in War Thunder, do not do it. It might be iconic, but for at least the initial month, maybe two of its release, if the simple act of flying an A-10 in War Thunder isn't $60 worth of fun for you, just know that this vehicle will struggle, it'll be spammed out a lot, a lot of teams will be saturated with what isn't a game-winning vehicle, and uh, a lot of enemy players will love to shoot you down. Anyway, that's going to be it for this video. I hope you have enjoyed. Please let me know what you think about all this in the comments section below. Thank you to everyone who joined in our recent live stream. It was really, really fun. I'm going to be streaming every Wednesday from now on. And until next time, thanks for watching. And I'll catch you lads on the battlefield. The BMP can be considered the very first of its kind of infantry fighting vehicles, and it's still in widespread service today. The easily recognisable machine has spawned a wide variety of variations, and served with over 65 nations since its debut in the mid-1960s. Like the MiG-21 of the skies, the BMP has proven an adaptable and timeless platform, remaining useful to this day in some very modern militaries. 